So I remember maybe when I was three years old, I'd get down on my knees every night next to my bed, and I'd say, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, what? I might die before I wake? I wondered why, and I was terrified, and I knew it wouldn't be okay to ask, so I never did. And then when I was four, my grandmother, Bonte, she died. She was sick. And now I know it was cancer. But anyway, they put her in a big hospital bed right in her dining room. And I actually thought she was lying on the dining room table whenever I'd go visit her. And then one day she wasn't there anymore, and that bed, table, whatever it was, was gone. And no one explained anything to me. But I knew something was wrong because I was sent away to my aunt's house for two weeks. My dad, it was his mother who died, seemed sad. Everyone seemed sad. I felt sad. But I didn't even know why. I just knew that Bonte wasn't ever coming to play with me again. And then many years later, my son died. Yes, that was very hard. In an accident. But I was totally unprepared for death, his death, anyone's death. And I learned we live in a culture that's also totally unprepared for death. It is in denial about death. Before death, after death, for the ailing, for the grieving. When I was pregnant, I got all sorts of books about birth and birthing. I took classes. I learned about options. My children had very educated births. For death, I had done nothing because there is nothing. And death happens to each and every one of us. So when my son died, my parents were both still alive. Then my father had a stroke when he was 80 years old. And I watched his vitality. I watched his functioning gradually falling away. He was so valiant and so stubborn. He fought as hard as he could for some semblance of his former pretty wonderful life. But after several years of extreme effort on his part, he ended up being bedridden in a nursing home. Even eating became difficult. And each and every time he had trouble swallowing, he was rushed to the hospital for medical intervention, which was arduous and exhausting for him. And after several months of this, he mumbled to my older brother, it's just too hard. And I learned how hard it can be to die in our culture. And I actually think my father felt like a failure because he was dying. And unfortunately, many people do feel like failures. Death is now a medical event in our modern world. Ancient cultures knew dying as a part of living for everyone. Some people do die suddenly in unexpected ways, and that's always tragic. But most of us die after a long life or a long disease, and we should be able to make decisions about our end-of-life concerns, about our deaths. Decisions consistent with our preferences, values, and personal priorities, all alongside the best of medicine. However, most of us wait way too long to give any of this proper consideration. Talking about death is considered taboo. It's not done. Just as I knew never to ask about my frightening childhood prayer, and no one talked to me about my grandmother's death, talking about death is a no-no. And this needs to change. We need to create a new cultural norm. People need help with meaningful and useful conversations about death. A hundred years ago, people died in their homes. It was accepted, planned for, talked about. Family and relatives were there. Children were included. Most people now would prefer to die at home, but... Less than one-fourth do, and 20%, that's one-fifth, die in intensive care units. Patients and families need to talk with their medical teams jointly about what is best for all of them and to keep reassessing as time goes by because it will change. Doctors know diagnostics. Doctors know treatments. But patients know themselves, and there needs to be some communication among them. Life is finite. We are mortal. Our lives are going to end, whether we like it or not. And we need to talk about what we want at the end. And we also need to talk about what's possible. At some point, we may need to balance the benefits of more treatments against burdens and risks. Personalized medicine, I like the sound of that, would be a new kind of person-centered care, factoring what matters most to each of us, to you, to me. Death is viewed now as a medical failure. It's modern medicine versus the reality of death. And this probably began with the development of the pacemaker way back in the 50s. It was revolutionary then to be able to save the life of a vital 40-year-old. And that was great. But in an older population, does technology save lives or does it prolong deaths? 
Do you want a heart to keep beating if the mind is no longer functioning? So there's a very vague line which separates natural declining old age from prolonged death. And this is different for each person. But how and who should determine this? And would we rather die too soon or too late? Doctors, we know, are doing their best. They're trained to focus on what they can fix, and they have an obligation to prolong life, which sometimes means that what they do leads to pain and suffering, poor quality of life, and high cost. We now have faith in medicine and a resistance to death. We avoid the D word as much as possible, and even doctors avoid it. There's no training. I did not realize there's no training in medical school on how to talk about death. So doctors are therefore uncomfortable talking about it. They avoid bringing it up. Their answers or avoidance will shape when and how we die. Most of the time, what's needed is plain talk. We need to be told a disease or an ailment can no longer be held at bay that more treatments might mean more burdens with unsure benefits and extreme costs. An honest, you are facing the end of your life. You are dying. Those could be the most caring words a doctor ever says. And patients themselves need to learn how to say no to a doctor, no to more treatments, to say enough if that's what they truly believe. Open conversations early enough about end-of-life options are essential. They can offer each of us a better death, a better ending, one with less fear, less pain, less resistance. Most of us wait until our last two weeks or even just 48 hours before entering hospice, even though patients under hospice care usually live longer and more peacefully until the very end. In a hospice, they die with dignity, they die with family and friends near, it's a good option. People need to understand it as one. So we need a cultural shift in how we think about health and death. We should think well-being is a part of illness, dying, caregiving, and even grief. They could be considered developmental tasks for living a full life, consciously considering and discussing how we want to complete our lives, allowing our stories to end well. So we do have a cultural norm about death, and it, it has to be examined. Should death be regarded as the enemy, regardless of circumstances, to be fought at any cost? And what about any economic incentives within medicine? So when you put all those things together, it's not surprising that there still are a lot of treatments at the very end of life. Medical technology tends to win out over natural death. There are no easy answers. There's no easy solution. So there's all kinds of conflicting values and points of view and legal rights and doctors and trying to figure out what to do. Every single life is unique, and so is every death. And there's no maps for this territory at all. But by having conversations about end-of-life issues, individual maps can be created. And these individual maps will assist our culture in embracing the reality of death and I like to think this just might make living all the better. 